Alrighty. So I found this issue based on the email that uh, uh, Matt sent out. So I've not updated it since like yesterday afternoon or whatever. So if there's any late modifications, then we can talk about this. So I basically just pasted all the the you know the things we had. What I haven't done yet is I have not applied the attributes targets kind of thing because I don't quite understand where these go in all cases. Like I, I read some of the descriptions and I have some questions myself. So. I, I did not do all of that yet, but hopefully. so if you scroll scroll down to the yep. bottom, um, all the way to the bottom, yeah, right, right there. Yeah. So yeah. this is a copy and paste of what I have right now nice. in my draft PR. I don't know that I got them all right, but I can tell you why I chose what I chose. That totally works for me. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we actually look at APIs and not just um, very rough email or something. Um, all right, so like, how do we want to walk this? Like, I think Matt grouped them by certain things like preconditions and post conditions. Yeah, they they fall naturally into families, I guess. Um, so the, yeah, these are generally in the same order, right? So <clears throat> the first category, the first two, are about. Um, regulating input um, beyond what the nullable annotations require. Right. So it's about <coughs> saying a null is allowed in here even though, even if, the, you know, sometimes it's a generic context, right? Even, even if the type wouldn't normally allow it. So it's expressing special leniency or the opposite, null is not allowed here even if the type allows it. Those are preconditions in it. I was going to say, and it's relevant for both generics and non-generics. Um, generics is obvious because the define, you know, the, the person defining the class, if it's unconstrained, doesn't get to specify question marks on things. Um, and non-generics, in a variety of situations, if a property is defined uh, to be, say, string, but the getter and the setter disagree on what can be returned. You know, null versus non-null, and what can be set null versus non-null. These allow you to override what's been set as the, at the property level. Right. For um, there might be an argument as to could we make do with fewer? Like, why why is allow null and maybe null? Why why are they different? Um, one describe one describes preconditions, restrictions, and input, and the other <laughs> describes what can be expected of output. And in certain cases, like ref parameters, for instance. They really have to, they really do mean different things on the same entity, so you can't like collapse them into one. Actually. Because you have an input and output. Yeah. It's the same thing as the input and the output. Yep. I don't know if um, allow null and disallow null would be reasonable on returns. So that we have them, these have yeah, them they, on returns. I don't know if they go on returns. Yeah, these are. That might just be a copy and paste. Right. These are input only, so they should not. They should probably not go on. Why are they allowed on methods? What is it? Um, in, on the method? in order to allow them on get it, get and set accessors, I had to allow method. Okay. And that's why we don't have delegate because it doesn't make sense there. Right. Okay. So, that, and that goes to one of your open questions, I guess, which is. Um, when these go on properties, should they go on the accessors or should they go on the property itself? What Steve did right. for now, but it's it's, it's not something we it's something we could close on here, is to allow them on the accessors, which is why you need the method thing, right? Um, but we, if we had them instead go directly on the attribute, just like they would go directly on oh, sorry directly on the property, just like they would go directly on the field, um, that it would look a little different. Hello. I think from the IL perspective, you wouldn't want it on the property itself. You would want it only on the accessors. Because in IL, you could have more than just gets. And you could also have like uh, properties with parameters, like you can be. Right? Because um, you could do you indexers, can, but with you can, properties. Yeah. Essentially. So you wouldn't want it on the property. Uh, 
it would then apply to the, the value of the, the property, I guess. I think both are reasonable choices. Um, I mean, the question is how many things do you want to support, right? I mean, what happens when you put them on the property and then also on the parameter? Like, then at that point, you just have to decide what what version you have, right? I guess you can't put them because it's well, I guess on the index. Right? Well, I mean, if you if you put them yeah. on both, I guess, like in your source. Uh, and they were disagreeing, right? You know, you put this allow null on the on the property, and then you put allow null on this on the getter or whatever, then uh, or the setter. I mean, then we'd probably just error, right? I imagine we'll have a test. I wouldn't it be desirable to decide one place or the other here, and then just say that's the only way you can do it? Yeah, I would agree with that because I mean that seems more logically. You also don't want, I think. You know inconsistency in usage as well, right? You want people to have one way of doing it. And I was like, I think if you do the property, then there will be some non C sharp languages that wouldn't be able to properly express things. They've got more than just get and set, or different variations. And we can always add to the attribute usage, right? If we find another thing we need to put it on, we just add it there, right? How does that work with auto properties? That's can you can you annotate the getter and setter for an auto prop? Um, I mean, can you syntactically put attributes on yeah. it? Yeah. I believe so. Yeah, because we do that with a uh, read only for the read only. I mean, we do that in sort. Sure, I'm, I meant syntactically. Yeah. But given that you say get and set, I mean, we should be able to put stuff in front of it. I think, I mean, it's it's just, I think it's mostly just a design decision. There's, on the one side, if you have a field, for sure you have to put it on the field itself. You right. don't get to put it on the input or the output side of the field, because there's no syntactic distinction. Um, so we can either use the field analogy and say properties should be annotated the same way that fields are. If you change a field to a property, you know, the, the attribute stays in the same place. Or you can say, well, Attributes, well, properties have more specific places. They actually have a place for input and a place for output, and it should go there. Either principle makes sense to me, and I'm, I'm vaguely in favor of the uh, analogy with with the fields, but no, I don't think it's a big deal. I think that's how people think about it. I mean, like the only thing is, like, do we ever want to have different different representation for input and output? I would hope not. Well, they will, they will actually often differ. Input and output will differ in even in the core library. Yeah. But for properties? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We even have cases when annotating like the simple knowable annotations, we could add question mark to the return type, but we didn't actually want it to return a null value, or we didn't actually want to accept a null value. Like we just yeah, wanted like, to be uh, able to property. return a null value, but we didn't accept null. Yeah, you know, like a property that lazily initializes if it's null, and then a setter that allows null and you know basically resets it. Yeah. Yeah, they actually go both them both ways. But there are also fields. <laughs> well, there's at least one field, uh, a public mutable field somewhere. I can't remember which one it is. It oh, there's a couple in Strongbox, for instance. Yeah, Strongbox is the main one. Um. But you have a field that differs on input and output as well. Um, so this will come up in various places. What if we said you had both, and the for the property form, it was only allowed for auto props, in which case we would put it on the private field, the backing field that was omitted. I see no way. Um, which would be used for reflection or other. I don't know why you would only allow it for. I mean, I get you raise a question of what should auto properties do with their backing field, and that's something we can we could do the right thing. But I don't think auto properties, at sort of user facing level, they don't differ from other properties.
I, I'm a little so, so you say you have to put the method thing on in order to be able to use the accessors as targets. Okay, if you want to use, yeah, if, at least that's my experience. If you want to, that the, the accessors are considered methods as far as attribute usage goes. That seems a little uh, unfortunate because then they, it'll be overly lenient in other, like you would actually be allowed to put these on methods even though it makes no sense. And we could make that a compiler error from, from right. the C sharp side, but that doesn't stop anyone from making an well, assembly. You could there. also just not have methods. The compiler could special case these attributes would put on X to know they go either on the return type if it's on the getter or on the value input. Because I, I, I mean, I, I oh, keep, sorry, keep going. Back in method internally. I'm, I, I know I'm the one who, you know, defaulted to putting them on the, the accessors, but I would actually sort of lean with Mads and say, we get rid of the method thing on the top four. It prohibits you from using it in places that don't make sense. And the first two apply to the indirection. They always apply to the indirection. There's really only, regardless of language, there's really only one thing on properties that has an indirection, and there's really only one thing in properties that has an out direction. Um, you know, there's there are other potential accessors, but neither of them. I mean, we can just say these apply to get and set. If there's fear in the language, tough luck. Um, and then we make them as restrictive as possible and enforce their consistency and usage. And we can all we can always loosen this later. Yeah, we can always add to it. Maybe. Yeah. Another one to say. All right. So that means we remove method from hello now. And if you want to use them on properties, you have to use them directly on the property. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, while you're at it, email, please remove return value from the top two. Uh, from the top two. All right. And so the compiler would know if on a property you put allow null, it would go on the getter, and if you put Maybe no, it would go on the center. Or That's what it applies to. Yeah. yeah. Why why is allow multiple set to true? Yeah. That seems strange. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure what to do there. There are some where it was clear to me, like it didn't make any sense, and for the top four I wasn't sure. So I left it as basically true and figured we'd talk about it. I don't think that makes any sense. Right. You don't have any parameters, so they can't be different. <laughs> It, you, right. It was. It was more a question of do we. I, I wasn't sure what our philosophy was. If we explicitly prohibit such things, or if we just treat it as okay. Well, there's multiple, but so what? There's at least one. So is the compiler going to error if you try to put both allow and disallow null on the same? Uh, I imagine we will. I don't think we know how to interpret that. I was about to say, what do you do when you implement it with that? You're just saying, well, <laughs> it's both of these things. It's a, it's a, it's a quantum now. <laughs> yeah. We, I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a language position there. Um, we could make it focus, like we can make it like we can't deal with this, or we could apply the most restrictive. Or I would think the least restrictive in that case. Maybe the least. But that does raise the question, if they are mutually exclusive, should they be the same attribute with a Boolean, you know, null allowed, true, null allowed, false? Yeah. That's well, a good we question. Know. We did start there, right? We started, we started at one with a, with a Boolean flag, and then we came to this. Um, yeah, I think having one, like a null, allow null attribute, true. Allow no faults. You know, you represent the intent. I, I'm a little. I, I, I get what you say, but there's a, the, the problem here is that it sort of gives the illusion that there are only those two possibilities. But the, but there's a third option, which is leaving it off, which means neither of those two sometimes. Right. Especially in a generic setting, that's allow all true, allow all false, and that's allow all whatever it said, whatever it, you know. It resolves to from the type. So if you so if you have the true and false, it just sort of gives the illusion that it, it's just those are the only two options, and you could almost make one of them the uh, the false. We That's could have uh, allow null that takes a an, a, a nullable of bool, and then you could have allow null null 
<laughs> pull up the wall. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please don't take me seriously. <laughs> I would say just from a syntactic standpoint, I would avoid having parameters because if you actually put them on parameters, it will get very busy quickly, right? I think if they're just simple attributes, just one name in brackets, I think that's much easier to read. Yeah, I do think it reads better when they're broken out. But I, I think it's also smaller metadata because you don't have to code them all. Mm. Yeah, encode the rule as raw bytes every time. So, okay, so we agree that allow multiple makes no sense on the first two at least, right? The first four. Yeah. The first four, even, okay. I think it's, yeah, I think this is. And I think that's the default, right? That is the yeah, And I think allow so, multiple actually does make sense on the baby null whens, because you might have multiple cases where. Um, and. Can we get to those? How would that make sense? Yeah. You could have multiple conditions where it might be null. Well, the, so yeah, but it's, it's a Boolean board. about the return value. Right. Okay. There's, a, there's only two possibilities, and if both of them are the case, then just use maybe null. Yeah. Maybe null when false, and maybe null when true. Okay. It's just maybe null. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're better off forcing you to know. <laughs> That's fair. Um, so Heath is asking in the chat, should we, I think in, apparently in the, the cell annotations on the native side, they have, you know, it's all underscores all over the place, so, but they all start with in or out to make it clear where, where they go. Um, did we think about that at all? Because, I mean, when I read them for the first time, I also had to read the comments to understand which one goes where. It wasn't super clear just by the naming which one is out and which one is in. <laughs> Some of them are both. Uh, are they? I don't yeah, think yeah when you get to the conditional, they're oh, actually yeah. both. I um, see. So we would lose the naming consistency if we did that. But we could have in out, right, if you really care. But I guess in that point, it would be very weird to say in out because you would have to. Well, it depends where you put them in. Um, I mean, my only concern is like, I mean, I wrote this in the. In this issue, when I said like I want to group them somehow because compiler service already is pretty large in terms of mm -hmm. API surface, um, I think a prefix would just make the APIs really you know long again, and then same problem. It gets very busy when you have extra signatures. Um, so I'm not sure when. But I mean, in is at least short, but still, it's like additional you know two to three characters you have to put everywhere. Maybe it's just the first time hit problem. So would that be like in allow no, in or out maybe no? Something like that, yeah. It also reads funny, yeah. <laughs> I could see like maybe no out or allow no in. Those read fine. Uh, so suffix, yeah, that's fair. Allow no in or allow no input gets longer and longer, but no. Then you have maybe null when, and then that be maybe null in or out when. Ref. <laughs> yeah. Heath sets obviously don't include the underscores. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I, I agree with that. Well, All right, let's just first the go maybe over the rest of it. null are still only outputs, right? They're the outputs, but not the inputs. The maybe null and not null themselves are only outputs. Uh, and then no, not null when, maybe null when are both only outputs. No, they are also an input um, because they can be applied. They they are post conditions, so they talk about what is what is known after the method has been called. Right. But but they can either be they can either be mutating an output, or they get producing an output and saying something about that output, or they can be testing an input and saying something about that input. So, if for example, string dot is null or empty. Its argument is not null when false. Yeah, so that one does go on an input, but it's still a post condition. It doesn't restrict the call. It just tells us something about what what's the case after this. Not null when true. No, it's not null when false. If string that is null or empty returns false. Oh yes, no, yeah. 
<laughs> now. Yeah, I wish okay. Boolean only had one value. <laughs> So, I call this a Zulian. Uh, all right, so first four, then we're covered with that, right? Yes. So the so the third and fourth retain their return value target. Right. I think somebody I've heard, I think Stephen brought up there should maybe with a capital B. To me, as a non-native speaker, I honestly did not get the differentiation <laughs> that Stephen wrote an email. To me, it's just, I don't care. Like yeah. It's two words versus one word. And I'm always confused when it's which, so I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I would argue vaguely for keeping what's there because of the symmetry with not null. So you say the, the, the value is maybe null or the value is not null. Those sentences both make sense if the maybe is one word. And regardless uh, of this, otherwise, it, one, of them, one of them has a verb and one doesn't. If you if, if may becomes a word in itself, then that's a verb, but the other one does not. I would also say, regardless of the semantics of the language, that one reads better. It certainly looks nicer. And that it's one easier. Is, to yeah. right. Then the other one should be called may not be null. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I see. Yes. Well, I mean, it's it's the the phrase that used the value is maybe null mm -hmm. is. Sort of a, it's not really English. I mean, it's it is, but it's like more of a compiler speak. Whereas the value may be null is sort of the more what someone you know would normally say if they were speaking English. I understand that. It's more the analogy of could they be plugged into the same sentence in the same gap? Um, also, we're speaking C sharp. Language lawyers. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, unless anybody feels strongly, like, I, for me, it's either way. I have a slight bias towards this one, what's currently written, because it just looks nicer. But I that, have a bias that, towards that as well. When, that, we were designing, not... when we were designing the compiler API, I had originally had it as may be null, um, and it just, like, our, our public enums for mm. uh, the compiler. And we ended up going with this spelling because it reads better and it, it plugs into the in the same place. I had no problem with this until I spelled it out in my head, and then once I saw it with a capital B, I can't unsee it. But um, I actually don't really have a strong. Well, so you can keep seeing it in your head. <laughs> okay. A bit early for drugs. Um. So the allow multiple, we agreed that it should be false, right? So what? We shouldn't allow multiple on the first four. Yeah, Correct. I think we we're agreeing on that. Yeah. O'clock somewhere, you know. So we should allow multiple. We should. We should. No, it should be false. Yeah. So, but that's the default, correct? I think so. Yeah. I can't remember. I just write it here, just to be clear, and then. Anyway, whatever the default false is. The default. False is the default. Alright, then I'll leave it off. Um, all right. Also, I, I left off inherited here, but inherited defaults to true. I'm assuming we want that. That's what we want in general. Yeah, I would think so. We'd want it to. And that's the default for annotations too, right? If you want them differently, you overwrite them or them. Right? Inherited. So that is that for. What does inherited mean, actually? Well, if you it means whether if you, if you look at a derived override, or if you look at the override of the method, or something that it's applied to, whether it's meant to be applied to that as well. So this is not just for classes. It's actually a good point. I don't know. It might actually only apply to the types. I'm not sure it applies to methods when you override them. Really? I thought it did. I could be wrong. I mean, either way, let's say, I mean, if it doesn't, well, then too bad. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, if right. it does, then I would say we probably want the behavior anyway, right? The, the dot says, it says true if the attribute okay. can be inherited by the right classes and overriding members. Okay. Okay. I think we want that. Yeah, I think, yeah. We will have to. We can also just write a test to validate. Um, do we want that again? Uh, are there cases where the combination would 
you certainly you might get redundant ones. You know, we have generic instantiations override. I mean, the the downside to uh, inherit true allow multiple false is, I believe, if it derived, you know, override tried to specify the attribute, it wouldn't be able to. Again, I think. Um, would that be unfortunate? The other thing is, if it was inherited, we might run into scenarios where someone's trying to loosen an assertion. For example, someone has disallow null on, a, on the top level one, but you have an implementation and you want to allow null for that one because you handle it correctly. Um, we might we might run into a scenario where we have both. Don't know right. which one is the real one. I would actually probably then suggest that we don't have inherit, um, and then people will have to specify it manually. We we sort of intended to have behavior in the compiler that would actually regulate this and yeah. compare overrides and make sure that they were in accordance with what they were overriding, but not necessarily the same. But we probably won't get to implementing that. So I could be wrong, but I thought when you get the attributes, you can ask effectively what type they were applied. These are the attribute data, I think, that was present. Not present when you call get custom attributes, but I'm not sure how the compiler does it with the symbol APIs, but I would say if you can tell which type they were applied to, you would basically just say if any of the attributes are applied on the on the inherited one, you basically ignore all the ones from the base. If none of them are on the inherited ones, you take all the ones from the base. Right. The problem is that absence of an attribute means something that you can't express with an attribute. So if none of them are present, that also has a meaning. And so you so can. It looks. Sorry, I was going to say it looks like I was. It looks like I was wrong. Um, the even with allow multiple false, it looks like an overrider can specify the attribute again. Yeah. So as long as you could actually detect that it was inherited or not, you would be able to detect presence. Yeah. But then, what's the point of inheriting it if we want to detect? If we want to detect the cases where it's not repeated and say, treat, behave as if it wasn't inherited. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Sort of. <laughs> it, then it, at that point, it's, it's pointless to inherit it. Well, you could, you could have the compiler detect it another way, such as like if the entire type is annotated, then you could avoid emitting the attributes of the method again, provided that they match what they're inheriting. So it, it, you could use it, you could still detect it in the compiler while reducing metadata, which is also hurting startup time in the runtime. Well, I think, but, but if, if no nullable attributes are present, it would basically put you back to, you have no annotations, right? Everything would be, what do you call it? Not ambivalent. Oblivious. Yeah, oblivious, right? But would you ever want that? I don't think you would, right? Okay, I can see how you want to loosen it from, not null to null or the other way around, but it, like, why would you ever go back to, I don't know. Well, it, it, it's a, an existing library is inheriting a type. So there's a null oblivious library that's yes. referencing a null aware library. Yes. And they're overriding a type that's in the null aware library, but they're still oblivious. And so you don't want, you wouldn't have any attributes there. But like I was saying, the compiler could have an attribute on the type that says the type's nullable aware. And if it's aware, but there's no attribute on the method, it could say, go look at the inherited state. I just think we're getting into something very complicated here. Yeah, I, it seems. I, I, if we want the compiler to disregard inheritance of the attributes, then we shouldn't do the inheritance. Well, I think we do. I think inheriting the attributes is worthwhile for the perspective of reducing metadata and hurting startup time. For nullable and your life. If if that's what we want, then we need to. Then we need the attributes to be different, and we need to be able to express all the options with attributes, not yeah. just with the absence of attributes. And we need to um, the ability for when you do supply an attribute that contradicts a previous one, we, we need the compiler to be smart enough to replace the meaning and sort of 
So why do you need the attributes that annotate not the case? Hmm? Sorry. So so given a type in a null oblivious library, there will be no nullable attributes whatsoever in this. And so the compiler could detect that it's null well, oblivious. This is not about null obliviousness. This is about I want to make a more permissive override. I'm totally even in total null aware land. I want to make a more permissive override. Right. So I want to no longer have the disallow null attribute on my generic param on, on a parameter that has a generic type. I can't put allow null because that's too lenient. I and my only option with the current set that we're proposing here is to leave it off. But if the attributes inherit, then that won't work either because I'm still inheriting the disallow now. That's why I'm saying then I need the let the type decide attribute, and then compiler needs to be smart about that. And that this seems like a, a lot of machinery. It also seems like you know it, the the developer specifying the override already has to specify the annotations again. So right. why wouldn't they have to specify the attributes again? Yeah. And even if all that wasn't true, we're talking about the compiler here, and it doesn't care about the inherited. Uh, property regardless. It can do whatever it wants. Right. So I, I, I get your concern about the metadata bloat. I think that these attributes are probably not what's going to be the cause of metadata bloat. The, 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 the attributes generated by the compiler are much, much more numerous. And those are, the one, those are where we need to be smart. Yeah, hopefully those are more <laughs> clever, right? You would hopefully use them sparingly in your library. Hopefully they're not everywhere. Because then the syntax would also suck quite a bit for those. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, the draft PR I put up, I'm going to wave my hands. There was something like 400 of these attributes applied, approximately 300 of which were does not return. Um, so there aren't that many compared to the literally there's a nullable attribute being generated by the compiler right now on every single method, right, every okay. single metric or loop, yes. regardless of whether it's annotated okay. with, with annotations or not. Yes. All right. So conclusion, not inherited. Yes, I'm not inherited. Yep. Do we want to, um, we have 20 minutes left. Yes, we should finish the other types um, before all the times we have. I had a question on the maybe null. Well, just the win, the wins one. Like, are we, we're special casing Boolean return values? Yes. Yep. <clears throat> the reason being that this, um, this clicks in with uh, the compiler's flow analysis. Uh, the compiler, uh, both when it does a definite assignment analysis, but also the null analysis, it's able to have a maybe null when true and maybe null when false state where if you then branch on the result of the method, it can keep track of the different null states in the two branches. Is that also going to be usable by F sharp that doesn't use the try pattern? Because um, they return a tuple, basically, with the bool of the result instead. Well, they return a tuple, right, and it's an option, so the, the option will be annotated correctly. Right, so you'll have, you'll have the valid case and the invalid case, and they won't have this problem at all. Okay. I mean, to, Eric, to Eric's question, there are, just using Corlib as an example, we, we talked about this uh, yesterday or the day before <laughs> offline. There are a few cases in Corlib, for example, where we return an enum instead of a bool. And so the, it ends up being if foo equals enum.success or something like that. Um, and so we were talked about, well, you know, could we add, instead of taking a bool here, could this be an, an object? And have it be any constant value that you can specify, you know, in, in an attribute. Um, but um, it was deemed that at present that's just not feasible for the compiler. And I think if, if it becomes feasible, we could always add another constructor overload here that just takes an object <laughs> and a new parameter or a new property and a new property. I mean, the the property it would almost is, be like it would almost be like we'd have to add a whole new attribute. Yeah. You could do that, or I mean, or it could just be maybe no one attribute that takes an object and a return value object, or something like that. Also, I mean, I added these. I mean, on that note, I added these properties to the attributes because it's sort of you know, good style hygiene. But yeah. it's not clear to me that they're actually useful. Yeah, it's in the, the compiler the guideline says you should do that because it's the the assumption is that some people still call get custom attributes and they get actually instances of the attribute, right? 
But yeah. anybody who reads metadata would not need them. It's just that code for them. Um, okay, just wanted to make sure I was understanding that correctly. Um, I mean, and since they're attributes, if we wanted to add a return value object, we wouldn't even like we wouldn't even really bloat the metadata like return value ask return value object to a boolean. Yeah. So they we we probably have an option to expand in the future, but um, yeah, we'll have to. Wait, sorry, Fred I, Fred, I missed what you were saying. What would we change? That wouldn't be a breaking change? You could make return value, uh, the, you could make the getter for that just cast uh, the return value object to a Boolean. And anybody who reads metadata would be, would be broken because they are looking at, you know, they're looking at the actual metadata. Um, but No, but, we, this, but this property as it currently exists, wouldn't, wouldn't we would need a second property. No, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, right. I'm just saying it wouldn't be an auto property. Yes. Right. Yes. Really okay. Um, um, so, we want to we want to move on to the on. other attributes. So, one thing to just to Sorry. note about these two attributes, maybe null win and not null win, is that they are actually only two of the four possible combinations that are found in Corelift today. This I was actually wrong about that. Uh, oh. There are three of the four combinations that are found in Corelift today. Oh, okay. Well, forget, forget that then. We, <laughs> we figured that all four should be expressible because the symmetry of it is just <laughs> compelling. Oh, okay. That way it gets more complicated. Um, the not null of not null attribute, that's probably the most complicated one of them all. Yes. Um, but it, it turned out to be very useful. <laughs> um, so this one says that the, um, uh, that a given output is not null if a given input is not null. So it's, it's describing the, um, a, a correlation between an input and an output. I think just to note, I think I got the attribute usage wrong on this one as well. I yeah. think we want to remove method and property. Yes. It's also relevant to a parameter. What's that? It is. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, interlocked exchange or volatile write. Um, they would go on. You would put not null if not null on the first, uh, the first parameter, uh, specifying the second parameter, because it writes the second parameter to the first. And so, if the second is non null, then the first will also become non null upon, yeah, as a post condition. Yeah, makes sense. I see. I see. Um, okay. So, if it's not on property, uh, how does that work with? Indexers. What do where where do you specify something for an indexer? Right. So I could have an indexer with a parameter that I could say that uh, the getter returns not null if the parameter to the indexer is not null. You'd have to. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can. Say that. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say I hadn't considered properties with. Or maybe I had, and that's why I have it on here. I'll give myself the benefit of the doubt and say that's why it was there, but I think the reality was copy and paste. Um, I hadn't considered indexers. Yeah, I don't know that you can specify a return target on an indexer. That would be how you, you would do you, it. I, I don't believe you can, just like you can't specify return on a, a regular property. Right. Um, but then you would put it on the property, I suppose. Right? Yeah. And just say for a property, it's not not null, not null. Uh, properties don't have parameters, so this one wouldn't apply there. Is uh, it names? Well, indexers do have parameters. Um, why are but we, indexers do. Is there a reason we don't have that one get up there? How, why would it apply to a delegate? You don't have delegate up there. Right, because it doesn't apply to a delegate itself, it applies to the return type or parameter of a delegate. Right. The, me the method here is erroneous. Method shouldn't be there, okay. if that's what you were looking at. Yeah. yeah. Basically, it's parameter, property, and return value, then. And we property only if we care about it, <laughs> which makes it different. 
if yeah the index of base can probably punt um it seems like structurally possible but very unlikely yeah, and i think yeah. most people will use int index or index oh don't rather than on that but classes <laughs> yeah but having you're making a dictionary <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, I didn't think of that. One. Is there a reason a we don't dictionary have... that returned you one of the keys? Yes. Um, and then shouldn't that also? So everywhere we have parameters, shouldn't we have generic parameter? That is a target. I don't. I don't know what that would mean. Can you give an example? I don't know what it means. I'm just looking at attribute targets, and generic parameter is one of them. Probably a type parameter. <laughs> uh, Does that mean type parameter? You just can't go on type parameter. Yeah. Okay. Do we even have a, you can't even express it in C sharp, can you? Yeah, you can put attributes on yeah. high parameters. Where would you yeah, you can't put them on arguments, but you can put them on parameters. I can put, put them in between, the, 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 between the bracket? Yeah, yeah. Sure, why not? In the no, no, no. Yeah, well, but okay. you can put them in the, like, in the specification of the type, but, like, where I really wanted to use it was inside of generic arguments, like action, open brace, or yes. open bracket, you know, uh, attribute um, and uh, can't do that. if we start allowing that at some point then we could get the next level of mileage out of these right yes okay um, this one's a little multiple true because you can have different yeah this one we actually have cases where there are multiple because you can specify uh, different parameters right for example delegate dot combine that takes a two delegates um, this has two return not null if not null attributes on it, one for each parameter, because the return of delegate.combine will be non null if either of the inputs was non null. Can the parameter name be null? Because it seems like looking at your method body, it can be. Oh, you thought I would accept it. Never mind. I did it already. All right. Which, by the way, you should never do from an attribute. <laughs> Really? Yeah, because if you otherwise if you, if you say get custom attributes, you just it basically just blows up by getting in the data. What are you supposed to do? I uh, just deal with it. So that means parameter name here should be nullable string. Yeah. Well, well, well it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be nullable string, but it should gracefully not die. <laughs> so what what does that mean? I don't know what that means. Uh, it means you will die later. Um, we could reference it, yeah. The compiler, when it sees that attribute, it it will blow up at best. The compiler should complain that this thing is null. You should probably convert nulls to empty string, probably, or something. Yeah, and then all the parameters that have empty names will... I mean, it will very soon die. That, you know, <laughs> there's a... There well, this particular be, thing, I, I think Steven's asking the general case, what do you do with that? I haven't actually checked. If I if I write an attribute like this and I specify null, and I'm in a, a nullable aware context, will the compiler complain? Yeah. Good. Okay. Then it's fine. <laughs> Theoretically, you're only using this if you're in the nullable aware context. So. A few more to go. All right. So let me just scroll here because I'm looking at a different thing on my right side because I'm editing while we're talking. So the yes. not null if not null attribute, if you have uh, multiple on the same parameter, it will, it is exclusive, right? Like if one, if, if one value is not null, then you know that that guy is not null? If one of them is not Correct. null, Correct. Yes. Yeah. It's an, it, it's an or, basically. Okay. Good. it make sense to instead accept a params string so that you can specify multiple strings? in the same attribute rather than having multiple attributes in the parameter? Usability-wise, that might be an advantage. Um, I would worry about, here I would worry a little bit about the bloat, given that it's so rare. Now we would have to have a, a string array or something inside of the attribute instead of just the string. But that's the only. Yeah, it seems rare enough, right? It is pretty rare. I think I I think that's the only case. There there are several cases where there are multiple not null if not null attributes on various aspects of a method, like the two I mentioned before, interlock exchange and volatile. Oh, sorry, interlock exchange has not null if not null as on both the return and on the first argument, the first parameter. 
Um, but I think delegate combined is the only one in correlate that has two not null if not nulls on the same, like both for on return, for example. On the same output. Okay. Yeah. All right. The last two have nothing to do with nullability per se. I mean, they have more control flow, right? They're well, the control, the control flow, but that's not return. That should at least have attribute targets constructor. But method covers that, right? No, no, no. it's different. It's yeah. different. Huh. What what would having it on the constructor do? Well, because different. people can. Oh, so sorry. Do for, for it does not return. You said. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. it's leap. I mean, we're we're here to support people's terrible ideas. Not <laughs> so are we? Like, um, and I. I mean, do we do we need it on delegate then as well? Like, that's a that's a question I was going to ask. Yes, I think we do. Yeah. What is the delegate? And, and then, you're and saying then, that delegate is only valid. The delegate, itself. The delegate so does not. Method. Instances of this delegate can only bind to methods which are marked as do not does not return. Well, except we wouldn't check that. But we just we could. Sense. But we could. That's what I'm saying. It's like that's yeah. a that's that's a sure. C sharp and Corefx should agree on whether or not that's a good idea or not. Because one thing is they can just not put it now, and then C sharp <laughs> could choose to do it later, and then in conjunction with the C sharp feature, could add that to that look at. I mean, it seems a bit contrived, but there's probably at least one person in the world doing that. Well, I would say that if we're not going to, I would say if we're not going to support it in the language, then I would say don't put it in the attribute use target so it's clear we don't support it. And then if that one person makes a compelling case, we can add it. Yeah, I mean, normally I would have said it sucks to version call it, but given that we know version everything at the same time, like, it seems fair. So do we consider throwing as part of does not return? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so anything that constructs exceptions or throws exceptions terminates the process. Anything well, that loops infinitely as well. Yeah. Well, throwing is the exception because it goes back to the parent context if there's a catch statement. No. Re return is means that this the, the invocation of the method where you called it, you will not reach the next instruction. Yeah. That, that is does not return. Does not return means that you do not reach the next instruction after a call. Yeah. It doesn't and mean that you die. The endpoint will continue next. The no, on error no. continue next, the code keeps going. You would reach next instruction. <laughs> the language has a notion of the endpoint of a expression or statement. The endpoint of the call is not reachable. Well, so what I was saying for on error continue next is if you have a method that's marked, does not return, but in VB you have on error continue next, it would still return from the method. No. Nope. No. Nope. The, the language makes it appear as if you need the next statement. In reality, you do not. The VB doesn't return these attributes. The okay. general doesn't have. Okay. Doesn't have primitive control flow analysis. Happens. But but he's right. Like in, in the normal exception case in VB, you would be able to reach the next one because you basically have a catch handler and you go to, to the next statement. Yep. Right? And VB would basically this attribute would be meaningless or on error reserved. VB. Right. So basically, you can differentiate between fail fast and close an exception, right? Yeah. Because fail fast on a resume next does nothing. The, the, the process right. will definitely terminate. Yeah. So the only, so BB will have, if we do the, start respecting the factors in BB, <coughs> BB will have to sort out its own rules. They may not be able to okay. get the benefit of this attribute. Because yeah, right. I was also wondering if this would be confusing to someone who sees does not return and they think that throwing an exception does return in a way. Sure. I mean, does... If people think of exceptions not in any way that has ever been described by .NET. <laughs> well, there's plenty of people that use exceptions for control flow, even if that's bad. I, but so they, that's the right music for that, by the way. But it still means that they do not execute a return statement or the implicit return at the end of it. I, I mean, if there's a better, it, it's if, like if you have a better name in mind, then we, we can consider it. I don't think I've got a better name. I was just, I, it might be clearer if it was two separate ones for always throws versus does not return. Um, Same thing. I don't. I don't think. 
I think there is an equal number of people who would be confused by those two, yeah. those two, as there would be people who are confused by this. Um, I mean, this is something where I would honestly say the documentation just has to describe the behavior because no matter what name you pick, there's no way we can describe all possible control flow exits in a name, right? So I think the only so then we're okay with both of them, I suppose that they are, right? Uh, the uh, does not return if uh, should be allowed multiple faults, I think. So which one? The doesn't return if should yeah. be allowed multiple faults. Yeah. Um, Again, right. yeah, yeah, for the same yeah. reason, it only allows you'll have two options. Yeah. Yes. And if you want both of them, there's the unconditional one for it. And and C plus plus uses no return for always throw. That's right. Okay. If we had to, we'd just be explaining in 10 years why we have both of these things that mean the same. And the answer is because there was a five minute review where we messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, for that's the does not return, <laughs> sorry, for does not return, we, we made a constructor in a method we decided no on delegate. Yes, I think we decided no for yeah. now with the potential that we, with the compiler and Corefx could coordinate and supporting that later. Yes. Yeah. So, then the only question that I have in the remaining two minutes is should we have a base type for all of them? The reason I suggest the base type for all of them is that when you go to MSD and you can click on the base type and we show you all of them neatly combined. If we don't Sorry. do it, then you basically have to have a documentation page where somebody creates a, you know, something by hand, basically. If we did, I don't think it should be for does not return. Um, I think that's very fair. Yeah, I agree with that. They, even though they're very useful for nullability, they're not about nullability <laughs> in the same way that the others are. All right. I, I'm also in support of this. I'm going to bike chat for two minutes about what the name should be. That's totally you, fine. Do you have... Uh, I just I just hacked up this thing here. So if you don't like this name, let me know. <laughs> Could we maybe have a compiler annotations and nullable annotations? That way you could have the does not return inherit from compiler annotations. You have the room to extend in the future if that's thing. That's actually not a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, aren't there already a bunch of attributes in system runtime compiler services that are similar in nature to does not return in that regard? Yeah, I mean, you can add a base type. That's not a breaking chain. Yeah. We get. We would have to. I think. Bike shed the name. I was going to say. I think my. Yeah, I was going to say. I think my point is we should. If we're going to add base types here, we should review it in the context of everything that would inherit it. Yeah. Yeah, that seems like a battle for another day where we have more than a minute. Oh. Well, then maybe right. maybe keep the does not return in particular as inherited from attribute like the other ones and put the rest of these as inherited from nullable. Yeah. I don't mind the nullable annotation one so much. It, maybe it's a little, maybe it's a little confusing because the question marks are also called nullable annotations. Um, but it's sort of like I don't know, nullable policy. Well, I would expect nullable. the nullable attribute that you guys have would also extend that. The only thing I'd be concerned about there is then when you click on nullable annotation. Well, I guess a lot of the a lot of the annotations in system runtime compiler services already are documented as you shouldn't right. ever type this because you shouldn't ever type the nullable attribute. Right, and if you try, the compiler will well, tell you not to do it. But that would be a that would speak against it having extend this base type well, because you are deliberately looking for documentation on the I think, grouping them for people to look for what they can write. Right, but the null, the root nullable annotation is also good for that. Like, you would have nullable attribute and nullable annotations attribute. And if you if you said give me all custom attributes that inherited from nullable annotation, you'd get nullable and all of these post pre conditions, and therefore you would have all the context you need for right. But you can't. The, the point is that you can't write nullable or taught and at least. Yeah. That's, that's the theory, is that you can, when you're looking for this stuff, if you're looking to like look through metadata, you, you can, you know, we can, we can put a link in the documentation. But if, if we're talking about a, a page of, these are the things I can write. Um, that's, I think, what we were talking about here. 
Well, I think the, the, with, with Nullable, like, I think the attribute is not as hidden as we think it is. It's hidden when you're in the source file, but if you do a reflection or if you look at things in the I'll spy until they actually support it, that gets visible to people, right? In that sense, I don't think it's bad if it extends it. It just means, yeah, you can't utter it in source code. If you, if you try, you get a compile error, so for, it's not like you're super For reflection good. and uh, expression generation, you would want to be able to find all of the... Sure, it's whether we optimize for the simple common case or for the advanced case here. Because I, I, the nullable attribute is, you know, roughly two orders of magnitude more complex than these put together yes. in terms of how to understand it. Um, so that's, I, so I'm just, I'm inclined to keep that a little on the side. Well, sure. If, if you feel strongly, we could do that to start and we could always revisit it later. Okay, then that was the other question I had. So the compiling service is namespace. Like that's a, that's a namespace that we generally tell customers don't go there. Like we tell customers, it's like, this is where we put things that the compiler needs as a function of its code spin <coughs> job. Right. Here is different. This is one where we're saying, no, we want you to use it. So I think that I, I don't, I don't, I'm doing the classic like, this is bad and I don't have a better suggestion. So it did not occur to me. System runtime annotations? I, 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 system annotations? How about system diagnostics dot contract? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I take that as a. I now consider has, that now carefully. You have to edit the recording. It's live streaming. It's too late. Sorry, out there. <laughs> I mean, all serious. And system dot diagnostics dot something seems like the most logical sure. place then. I, I, I mean, this to, to be fair, there's enough. I think we have like what twelve classes or something. I think they would be okay with like having their own thing. But it's it another is, way of grouping them. It know? is it is another way of grouping them, which I would be in favor of. And then you basically, I guess, Jared, in your worldview, the um, <laughs> the the nullable one would not be there. Right, the nullable one would go to compiler services because that's submitted by the compiler. You should never use it. And then the only ones that would go into the namespace are the ones that we actually expect people to write in source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So all, all of the caller attributes are in system runtime compiler services? Uh, do we think that was a mistake? Really? Yeah. Yeah, that was a mistake. Well, right. to be fair, everything that we, well, that the compiler has knowledge of, we put in compiler services. Yeah. I don't think we necessarily always consider that. Is well, I mean, except things like string. Right. Uh, Maybe that was a mistake. I didn't realize we'd done that. For which ones? All our info. Yeah, but to be fair, they are also very rare, right? I mean, they're not used that much. These ones will be used a lot more, right? So, <coughs> comparatively speaking. Well, I have also got unsafe and other stuff in there. Hmm. Yeah, but that one is still true. We don't want you to use it. <laughs> <laughs> use yeah, the, so use the actual syntax for unsafe. Method info for aggressive optimization and things like that. Method impulse and runtime compiler service? Yeah, see those. Yep. So if I wanted to rationalize them being in a different namespace, I would say it's because the 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 code and those the attributes that are there affect how the compiler observably affects how the compiler emits code, whereas this just changes the diagnostics. I guess one thing to consider with having them in this namespace is how is the effect on, say, IntelliSense? Uh, because now everything from compiler services will be in scope yep. more often. Um, yeah, it definitely feels nicer to say using system dot nullability annotations or whatever. <laughs> yeah, don't use nullability because then. We have the same discussion with the remaining two attributes again. I think just something got annotation for space. I mean, we could literally go with system diagnosis with annotations, right? Is that a name we already have? No. Okay. And it would be a peer to contracts, right? And contracts are like, don't use it, don't go here. <laughs> this stuff is deprecated. Go to the other side over there. Yeah? I like that. I actually don't. I mean,
If that's the case... Let me look at the chat window. Well, nobody's barfing in the chat window, so that, it, <laughs> that's a good indicator. And, and you know what? If, it says, if the name says nothing about nullability, then the, the flow attributes might also belong there. They also... Or do they drive... Do they belong in the diagnostics namespace as well? Which flow? Which flow? The does not return. Yeah, because that does it, again. It only affects diagnostics. It doesn't affect code scope. In that case, they they could actually is, go in the same place. Yeah. What about code analysis? Is that wait, 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 is that true, Jared? Doesn't won't the compiler do dead code elimination based on unreachability? Uh, the we'll do we won't do that based on the attribute because we can't stop F sharp from doing it. If we want, if you want the compiler to have, if the intent of that is to change how the compiler emits code, I think that we would have to do something stronger than an attribute, or we'd have to like that did not meet what my understanding of the attribute. Was. Yeah. So. Because we would okay. have like there's that is, it's unavoidable. So how, is, how how is the compiler going to code gen around a call to a does not return method, and like what happens if you. Uh, if you have something after it that you know doesn't return out of the method or something, the way the only thing that I my understanding of that attribute, what I envisioned it was that that affects our nullability analysis, meaning that for the purpose of flow analysis, we pretend things like throw helpers dot blah does not actually return, and so we consider everything nullable beyond that. We would not change like reachability <coughs> or reachability. So okay, that's. Different in my mind what I thought this attribute was. I thought this was solving the general issue of okay. wanting. I mean, um, I could be wrong, Matt. What, what were yeah, you thinking? Which, how did you view it? Because I, I, an, att an attribute is tricky to do. The, what you want, like, we need, like, it's something like we can't. My fear of using an attribute for what you're talking about, Stephen, is like, at, like, F sharp can add that attribute anywhere. And it's like, now what are we doing? Well, I mean, even if you did something else, you're still going to be emitting an attribute under the covers. Right, but we and can, but F sharp could still go and do whatever it wants. So it's no, really you're, you're presuming an implementation. Don't do that. <laughs> I can mod rec the shit out of it. And F sharp doesn't respect mod rec. No, they do because we mod rec so much crap in C sharp doesn't do. They respect mod recs now. Okay. Specifically because we started telling them you have to because this is dangerous. That's what I'm saying. Like we can, we can do it if we. If we actually want, we, we have options if we want to do the thing that Steve said, but I would think just a simple attribute is not enough because we, like the way we do re, like dead code and stuff, like we, the compiler alternates between, for instance, like if you do while true, like if you have a return, you can have a return value in C sharp and do while true. There's no ret instruction in IL. Like we we know because the CLR we there's an overlap between like CLR does not return analysis or other analysis, and we know for instance that while true never returns therefore you don't need a dot ret. Whereas if we called another method that had does not return, like what do we do? Do we just say well we'll put like a dot throw null after that? Like how do we react in the case where it does return? Because it's a legal IL basically it would fail. We have to do something yeah. like if you have a method by that has a return value. And something which just does not return, what do we do? We have to emit some code there to have legal IL. And that's why we've never, like, that's the trick of this feature is how right. you do that. And that's why I thought that the attribute was yeah. just affecting nullability analysis. I'm not saying you can't do the full feature, but that was a different feature than I was imagining when I read that doc. Yeah, I, the, the full feature is not one that we can be doing in C-sharp 8 time frame. Right. Um, is it something that you could determine how to emit the attribute in C-sharp 8 time frame, but not update the compiler to do it yet? That way, if we decide to support it in the future, we don't have to create yet another attribute um, in order to make it work. Well, the um, problem with just the... The, there's multiple problems there with that, but the, 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 the main thing is that we would have to create some new opt-in system for this thing, because upgrading to C-sharp 9 shouldn't suddenly start warning you about unreachable code, because uh, we updated our unreachable code analysis, and suddenly half your method bodies aren't considered reachable. Warning ways? <laughs> All right, let's let's like table this discussion a little bit because I mean, the, the thing that we just talked about was just the namespace choice, right? So like regardless of what C sharp well, does, I think the namespace choice 
should be somewhat orthogonal to this? Because well, but, but that, I think there are two things here. One, that if, if it's diagnostics and the attribute is affecting reachability, that's no longer diagnostics. And two, I made the comment earlier about the attribute not deriving from nullable annotation. If it's only affecting nullability, then I think it has to derive from nullable annotation. So let me just point out that nobody showed up yet. So I'm mildly confident that nobody will kick us out in the next 20 minutes either. So maybe just close on that. Let's just try to close on this then. So like, so first of all, what do people think of the system diagnostics are code analysis namespace? Because it already exists and has two things in it. So it's not like a super youth namespace. Um, that feels too tied to the name that we chose for our Roslyn namespace. Why would that matter? Because that's not I mean, a detail of the implementation. I guess it doesn't. We the code anal the name code analysis is a compiler that happens to compile C sharp. But to be clear, this namespace has existed like since V one of the yeah. framework, right? So like I mean, there's there's two attributes there in core. There's exclude from code coverage and suppress message. Yeah. Uh -huh. Didn't realize that it existed that long. I assume, yeah. I I heard that and assumed it was to do with Rosalind. Um. And I mean, they are. I mean, the grand scheme of things, that's what they are, right? They're basically support for diagnostics at compile time, right? So that seems largely in line with what the attributes are used for. And yeah, there's only two things in it. So if you add a using to that one, nobody will say, "Oh my God, you just buffed in my IntelliSense hundreds of types that I should never use." So it, that seems like a good choice. Seems fine to me. Yeah. Okay. And then. Um, so if we have that namespace, do we still think we need the attribute as the the, the base type? Because quite frankly, at that point, I'm fine with not having the base type at all. Me too. Like, it's... you can just click on the namespace and then you see everything. Yeah. And that will also get to the advantage that we don't have to worry about whether or not it does not return should have the same base type. It's it is true. Just, it's just in this namespace. Right. Yeah. Although I, I do wonder um, if we if we need to pick a different name for does not return. <laughs> I mean, it's. I had a very different picture in my mind of what it is, and I, I get that we can't make that work for C sharp eight, but um, I feel like that's taking the good name. <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of people yeah. who want it extended, and they're not going to stop filing issues. And if the language ever wants to do it, I don't think we want to have two conflicting names for what is effectively does not return and does not return, but does nullable an analysis. But like, well, from the earlier thing, what, what Jared said, it sounded like whatever the feature would be would not necessarily use just an attribute. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah, I think that, I mean, one of the proposals for the getting the actual behavior around non-returning methods is to have a new return type. N never type, essentially. Never type? Um, <laughs> it's like void, a except... Change. No, it's not. Like void, Actual except... So oh, it also doesn't give you a result back, but it even doesn't even return to you. Void plus plus. And that one would be more. And then we can encode uh, that whichever way. One. Then we can encode that whichever way we like. But there's no user facing attribute in that. Right. Yeah. You you pick a if you pick a sum syntax solution. Yeah. Like I said, I, I, we did this in Midori. It was great, and the feature was fantastic. But we used attributes because all we cared about was ten <laughs> Which also better jives with the philosophy to <coughs> not have too much semantic, like semantic impact with attributes. Yes. One thing is to affect the diagnostics, but another is to change coaching. Yeah. Merrick, you were about to say something. Yeah, I'm kind of sharing the student sentiment about the naming because I can definitely imagine, for example. On the cases we have in Xamarin where we generate code that as soon as the guys will see the attributes, they will kind of use that attribute and uh, just generate it everywhere simply because the name is so nice. Uh, it might not be exactly what the C-sharp will use it for, but kind of will be just abused because it's, it's in the framework. I mean, you guys will never use it outside of Nullable, though. Is that fair? Like, there's no other code path that checks for the attributes today that is not related to. Not Nullable. today, no. But 
because I could see people just trying to like get the control flow out of that, right? Like, I mean, that's for example, like, uh, what was this thing there that I always went into this? I forgot, like, uh, I can't think of it. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, like, the most common case is you have an Which if thing? check that throws, and you might have a helper method. And today, if you throw inline, the compiler uses that for reachability and initialization of variables below. Right. Um, but you might have to do an explicit else statement or something else if you use a helper method so that to help the compiler understand that today. Yeah. I think it goes back to Jared's point, right? Like it's not, it wouldn't be legal in IR, right? The, the compiler would have to decide to emit code differently to make right. that correct code. It's, I, I get what you're saying with the name. It, it does feel a little, it does feel absurd to be, I mean, we, we kind of want a worse name. So that that's weird. We are, the absurdity of we're in a name debate and we can't agree because we all agree we have the right name. Yeah, the name is to good. find the wrong name, <laughs> right? <laughs> it just, it feels absurd, but I do get the point. It does not return, but it's not the way it works. It should be. It seems like a good name to me. I like the name we have, honestly. Huh? I like the name we have. So what attributes and, are we you know, currently... Hey, actually, <coughs> another thing we could do is the compiler doesn't care if stuff is public or private. But that's not in... Oh, don't grunt. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm... Make it internal. I have... Put it on there. We can do the nullability analysis and do the real feature later. <sighs> no. That, 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 that seems like a... There's a word for that. It starts with age. I'm not saying it, but I think we're all thinking it. <laughs> I, well, I, think, I think the word is helpful. <laughs> if the compiler is going to have to do the real analysis using modrec and mod on, and if it does that using a keyword, like never, uh -huh. then couldn't you differentiate between does not return used for nullability and does not return using the keyword syntax whether or not the modrec or mod is there? So we could just use the name and extend it later. Yeah, now it's just, all mod recs do is mod recs say give me a type name. You can put this type name in the namespace, and then if we use a, if we if we use a syntax solution, we can just mod rec on top of that. Right. So we could use the name. I mean, honestly, I, I find it hard it to believe that we would ever do the feature that Steven wants without a syntax solution because it is so like it's like change the way yeah. you generate IL. Like Neil, it's very Neil would, observable. Neil would. I don't know, have an aneurysm of the suggestion for <laughs> changing the way we generate IL based on, like, code flow based on an attribute. Right? Now we know how to get him. Um, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. So, but I, but I think, so then the remaining, if, if that's true, I mean, yeah, I mean, and I, I, I think that's true, that we wouldn't do I mean, the feature you, you think this is with an attribute. Right? Yes. But then the only remaining concern is people might think we did. And they yes. see this one. They might think it does more, or expect it to do more than it does. Um, and it will make and some tooling difficult because they'll have to know to look for regular attribute versus attribute with mod. But I think that's no different than other attributes, really. I, I, I can, think I think they'll learn it. I think they'll learn that we didn't attribute yeah. the uh, didn't add the feature that we that they wanted pretty quick. Right? Like right. they'll say, oh. They'll have to return something. And maybe when we do a blog post detailing these attributes, we can explicitly list like, "Hey, this doesn't work the way Actually, you think it does." Actually, no. It's the best. No, you just tell them what it works, and when people complain, then in C sharp nine, you fix a customer. That's true. That's how we. Uh, that's how we see the <laughs> see the desire for the next feature. You're like that uh, the Dilbert cartoon about riding yourself a minivan this afternoon. Yes. What? You know, like oh, the the boss uh, offers to pay like twenty bucks for every bug fixed, and then the one of the engineers says, "Oh, I'm going to ride myself a minivan this afternoon." <laughs> <laughs> I think that was Wally. So, well, Stephen, what what what, uh, what APIs did we annotate with these attributes? It's basically a third. Fell fast and what else? With does with does not return. Yeah. Throw uh, So the three hundred something methods in Corelib that uh, throw, like regardless, <laughs> throw a 
and other throw methods. Um, they all have does not return. Fail fast has does not return. Debug assert, contract assert have uh, does not return if on the on the boolean. Um, trying to remember if there were others. Yeah, so I guess my question is also how well do they actually work when the compiler still does not quite know that code doesn't actually execute past this point? I mean, it's no worse than it is today, where it doesn't. The compiler doesn't know that uh, environment fail fast never returns. So you have to have a throw null or something after it if it is necessary for um, you know to get the compiler to actually compile. I mean, and also you do realize like the feature you're asking for would mean that we would introduce new warnings <laughs> for non-null code. Because exactly that, if we said that we know environment fail fast doesn't return, then we'd say the throw after it right. is yeah. unreachable. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, oh. So I, I it's like I <laughs> Yeah, I guess my question is like like these two attributes, how many <laughs> how many warnings do they fix? Because it sounds like we're kind of in this half pregnant state where we basically say Oh as for, as for about, can, yeah. So for nullability they fix I mean, half of the warning, half of the exclamation points we have in Corelib are because of does not return. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, so because because the common pattern, it's it's a little it's it's really surprising. But like, let's say you have a method that has a non-nullable string as an argument. Um, well, we can't be sure that someone's using the nullability feature and isn't passing null. So we have to say if string equals null, and we then say throw helper dot throw. The compiler helpfully says, oh, this was not null, but then you checked it for null, so it might actually be null. <laughs> and then you're not provably doing anything that's going to exit. So I, I have to assume that all subsequent code might see a null here. And therefore, it ends up warning anytime we use the thing that we just checked for null <laughs> that it might be null. I see. So, okay, the feature is actually. Okay. <laughs> yep. Now, you, might, you, can also, you can also argue that the heuristic is bad. Uh, which case the value of this becomes a lot less. That was an But Steve, you, you, you have this throw helper to work around the C sharp kind of code gen limitation. So, so if you could undo that and rely on the C sharp to generate better throw, I guess you would not need that. Uh, sure, anymore. but the, the code isn't just like. I mean, the, the, the code you're talking about is all the code associated with constructing, you know, loading the resources, loading the string, loading the arguments box. Like, that's a huge amount of code often to generate these exceptions that we throw. That all has to be separated out. Yeah. So, yes, if, if the C-sharp compiler could, um, you know, do the opposite of inlining with uh, with inlining. any time it sees throw new and take everything and put it into a separate method, sure. But we're we're not at that point. All right. So I think, like, as far as I'm concerned, I I, I see the problem with the name. People will probably try it. They will get disappointed, and life will go on. And I think that's. I think that I I don't see an, an alternative logically to that. We can try to name these guys better, more scope towards now, but like it seems. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm, I like the names of the way. I agree with you. All right. So then let's just say this is it. I will paste this guy in as far as I have it right now. And then you can all double check that what I have here is actually correct. Oh, that's beautiful. What happened here? Oh. There you go. That was again. Much better. Looked actually nice at my editor, but hey. Go to the left. I thought that would turn this constructor. Oh, yeah, it's there. So. <coughs> no, it's just not on a new line like everyone else. No, it's not alphabetical. That, that is correct. Actually, it just occurred to me. 
Steve, did you consider extending the method impro attribute? Basically, the one which has the inlining to also have like no return. It's basically enum, right? I don't think the compiler sees them necessarily, right? I don't think we know those attributes at all. I mean, right. the question with method impl is we usually we strip method impl entirely from reference assemblies because they are not meant to be for consumers. I mean, as the name suggests, it's an implementation detail, yeah. like, is this a runtime call? If it's not a runtime call, do you want to inline this or not? Whereas, right? whereas CoreFX is doing exactly the opposite with these, right? You're, you're yes. putting them on the reference assemblies only and not putting them in, in the final assemblies. Well, actually, we put both of them in the final assemblies. They are going in the final assemblies, too. That's how we actually round trip them. Uh, that's how Tanner was trying to do that. Which one? That I thought you were saying you weren't going to put nullable attributes. Only, the nullable attributes are only going in the reference. There was talk about stripping them, but that might hurt certain scenarios. Okay. And David Wright has been working on the Cuckoo hash filter to try and help with her startup. Yeah. So, I, I you had mentioned at one point. I thought that. Yeah, I, that, that was on the table at one point. I'm not sure if it still is. I mean, basically. I mean, I I I'd be concerned with putting this in method impl options if for no other reason than everything in method impl options is about runtime behavior, and yeah. everything we're talking about here is compiler. Yeah. Well, I mean, if the runtime were updated to support does not return. No, I don't think. Well, then it'd be, a, but it'd be a different feature than what we're talking about here. Right. Yeah. I mean, I didn't feel those method impl options. We should be careful because we're running out of bits there. Eventually. Oh no. Oh, it seems that we have enough there. We could make it work. We could make the C sharp feature work. I'm not worried about that. I, I, I'm. And we can make it work by using a mod rec on that attribute. I think Merrick was asking whether instead of having the attributes, we would just have them as method impl. Yeah, but it sounds like there's a mismatch yeah. between what the intention of method impl is and whatever it's called in this one here. This one is yeah. specifically there for the purpose of being in metadata so others can pick it up and, yes. and analyze space. Entirely compile time as opposed to entirely run time. All right, then uh, I will comment on this one. I can find my mouse again. Then we'll consider this guy approved with this shape. How soon do you guys need it in? Is it already in? Is the PR in progress right now? Does it Steven already have a PR up? I, for, yeah, so I, I'm not entirely sure what we want to do though, because I'm pretty sure that there's going to be analysis that the compiler does that creates warnings that I haven't either thought about or flagged or fixed. So if I were to merge this and then we took the compiler update, I'm expecting there's going to be a reasonable amount of fix-up work to be done. Yeah. So I'm wondering if I should, I, I've got the draft PR, I'm wondering if I should just sit on it until I mean, we I, take the compiler update. I don't well, think yeah, the I'm, compiler doesn't need we all we need is the shape of this API to yeah. test it, right? We yeah, yeah. Paste it locally. I think if you guys have the shape of the API, then we can cut and paste mm -hmm. that into our code and start going. Um, and then I I sent you an email, Steve. You're on the issue where I have the schedule laid out. Uh, okay, I'll take a look. Yeah, but it's with the goal is to get a compiler done by six ten, because that should hopefully give three weeks for core effects to come adopt and us to work through. Before we hit okay. seven, know that we cannot update the compiler now. We cannot update because it has to be changed. What uh, breaking change? Uh, I texted you offline. This the, the one fix caused our tests not to run anymore because it produces bad IL. Right, but we fixed that bug. That's not a breaking change. That's just a bug. Yeah. But, well, but it, breaking changes, you guys did something intentionally <laughs> that screwed but us. It, but it only but happens in CoreFX. That's the thing. <laughs> Right, but did you guys, because we hit the bug, we thought that's the same bug we just fixed in Core CLR. Okay, I, do, I don't know about that bug. I'm oh, sorry, I thought you were Can on the those. You mean Neil's bug? Yeah. yeah. I thought Has it was... that been merged yet? It wasn't merged this morning. He's working on a fix for it. But like... Right, the PR is up and it's not been touched in three or four days. Can you send me the link to that? Uh, can you send the link to it? Because I don't even know what the PR is right now. Yeah. Sounds like we need to send it. So that's, I was so thinking that's the same one. If not, then we need to look into that. It hit at the exact same time, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Regardless, though, when on 610, 
the last features get merged for the compiler, we should be able to, within a day, I assume, get a version of that into Core FX, or into Core CLR, rather. Right, we can get, as soon as the build for Roslyn gets up, I can fast track the change into build tools and arcade, and okay. you should have it. All the build tools? Later. Yeah, Core because CLR. Core CLR use uh, consumers. They're not build quite tools. off yet. Okay. Yeah, because I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be a little bit of back and forth on this um, to kind of nail things down the way we all expect them to be. Um, so the sooner we can get that, the, the better. Right. Uh, and then I'll give us, like, I think as Jared was saying, you know, two weeks or something to work through, probably do another, you know, one or two <laughs> rounds of find issues, fix the compiler, find issues, fix the compiler, um, and then call it quits. Jared won't be around for those, so it'll be easy. Yep. That seems easy. Victor, yeah, that's what will happen. Victor, is yeah. you were you guys were hitting in Core FX, uh, stack alloc for spam? No. No, it's something different? No. And it's not the one that Invalid the program exception bed aisle. On what method? On system, the, I have it open. Um, system, I owe enumeration file system name. You can send us the bed aisle. Yeah. It's not bad IL, it's just not great IL. <laughs> <laughs> Have a growth mindset, man. <laughs> there, there is no bad IL. Right. <laughs> okay, no, this is probably the stack Alec bug as well. Yeah? You think yeah. so? Well, because the the one method in there that's interesting has a stack Alec. Like okay. Spam, so. Oh, is it just span of byte equal or something equal uh, stack out? Span, that's why I thought it was span, span of t ten yeah. equal stack out. Like oh, yeah, that'll okay. that's the bug. Yeah. Do we have a build? Is the merge now? No, Neil's PR is still not. I'll ping it. God, it had the approvals in it. Uh, yeah, but it hasn't been touched in like four days. Because it's got three side offs, including one from you. It's a fun bug. He was out yesterday. Uh, he was working at home. Oh, he was working on a stock that he wanted. He gave during the time. Alrighty, then I think we are done, right? Anything else to add? Otherwise, that's it.